I'll just, I'll just be really upfront and humble before you and say this. I am not an expert on how to love God. I'm really not. I'm probably one of the least qualified people to stand up before you and tell you how you're supposed to love God. What I am an expert on, though, as a church brat, raised in church all my entire life, learning about the Bible since the day I can remember, I could, I could quote literally John 3.16 before I could spell my first name. Now, I have a long first name, so that might have been part of it, but I have been around the Bible all my life. And I have become an expert on what does not necessarily work in growing a love relationship with my God. And I want you to follow this because this is really important. Many of you, you can testify to these same truths because you've been trying them yourself. There are certain things that don't necessarily cause you to have a strong love relationship with God. Things like morality, right living, social justice, helping the environment, doing good for your neighbors. Are those good things? Well, absolutely. We as Christians should be taking care of our environment, should be helping our neighbors, should be loving others, should be doing things for others. But hear me when I say this, being moral and being nice to people does not guarantee a love relationship with God. How do I know that? Look at the most moral people who've ever walked the face of the earth, the Pharisees of Jesus' day. The number one most rebuked group of people by Jesus in all of Scripture are the Pharisees. And they tithed off of their salt and pepper, their mint and cumin, the scriptures say. In other words, they were so meticulously moral, they went to church daily, they were a part of the synagogue and the worship, and they tithed meticulously. You will never exceed the morality of the Pharisees, according to the scripture. Never. And yet they are the most rebuked by Jesus. That proves that morality does not guarantee a love relationship with the God of the universe. It just doesn't work. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the first three verses teaches us this. If I can speak with the tongue of men and of angels, all this knowledge, I don't have love. Worthless, it's a gong. There's nothing to it. You might as well not have it at all. If I can move mountains, Speak with my lips and move mountains, but have not love? Worthless. In other words, what's he saying? If I have all knowledge, without love, nothing. If I have all power, without love, nothing. And then he goes on to say, if I'm the most benevolent person in the world, if I give everything that I have to the poor, and I don't have love, what's it worth? Nothing. So moral living does not guarantee true love relationship. But how many people around us, even in our own churches, think that their love relationship is tied to how good they are, how much they work, how much they try to earn, how much they show off how holy and pious they are. Naturally, that's what we do as humans. We try to make people believe that we are better than we really are because we have tied our morality with love. For the Father. The second way that oftentimes we've tried to do this, that is a great thing, by the way, but it's not a guarantee for a love relationship with the Father, is attending church. Now, obviously, I'm speaking to the choir, you're attending right now. You're here. But being at a place like this does not guarantee a love relationship with the Father. Coming to church religiously does not guarantee a relationship with the Father. In fact, sometimes rituals. And regular activity, though good, the Bible does tell us not to neglect meeting together as some have become in the habit of doing in, in Hebrews. And so you should meet together. You should gather and worship. We should have these kinds of meetings. But just because you're in these meetings doesn't necessarily mean you will have a love relationship with the Father. In other words, you can be in church and not be a lover of God. It's possible. And the reason sometimes this happens is that sometimes we allow ritual to replace relationship. There's a story I read years ago that stuck with me. It's about a young man who was really wanting to impress his girlfriend, and he decided to find a special night where she was off work where they could do something very romantic. And she, he found out that this particular Tuesday night, she didn't work on Tuesdays. And so he set apart this night. He rented a tuxedo and a limo. And he got these rose petals and covered them all over the seat of the limo and just made it just, just beautifully romantic. He, he found the fanciest restaurant in town and he rented out the back room right by the fireplace. 
And it was just beautiful. And he, he did his research. Guys, that's the key to be a romantic. Do your research. He found out that her favorite color was blue and that her favorite flower was a rose. And so what does he do? He decides to find a blue rose. Very rare, very hard to find. But he went to the extra effort and he found this beautiful blue rose and he puts it right in the middle of this table. He writes her a beautiful poem and puts it on her placemat. Ladies, he really went all out. Not quite as romantic as your event that you told us about yesterday, Mike, but it was pretty close. I mean, he, he went all out for this girl. And the night came, and she, just like he predicted, she just loved it. Tears running down her eyes while she read the poem. It was a magical time. They connected like they'd never had before. You know what he decided that night? He said, I want to recreate this. I want to have this next week, too. In fact, let's call it Blue Rose Tuesdays. And we'll have it each week. And we'll come together and I'll plan it and I'll, I'll get it ready and I'll make sure it's perfect because I want to recreate this magical moment that we had. And so the next week they come together and it was good. It wasn't quite the same because it was a repeat of the week before, but it was still good and moving. And the next week, you know, same kind of thing, not as good, but still okay. And then the next week and the next week, and eventually, you know, he got so caught up in the, the planning of the room and the rose and the poem and the petals and the limo and everything, all the, the things needed to make this night just perfect, to recapture that first moment they had together. Eventually, you know, she couldn't come because she had to change schedules occasionally, and so he would still go ahead and have the Blue Rose Tuesdays without her. And eventually, she never showed up again, and he continues to have Blue Rose Tuesdays. You may be hearing that story and thinking, well, that's silly. That's ridiculous. Why in the world would he go to all the trouble to put together all of this romantic event to, to rent the room, to, to go to the expense of the limo and all this stuff, and the person of honor doesn't even show up? Why would you go to all that trouble? And that's exactly the question I think that the Father may be asking some of us here in our churches who go in week after week and we speak spend so much money and time and energy in doing what? Often we're trying to recapture that moment that we had at a youth camp one time when we, all the praise songs were just perfect, the lighting was just perfect, the mood was just right, and I had that kumbaya feeling in my heart, just that feeling of, oh, I want to connect with the Father, and now I need to give it a name and recreate it and have it every week, which may be wonderful, but if we lose sight on who we're supposed to be meeting, we might not even notice if they don't show up. Even if we give it a really cool name and have it on a particular day of the week, we can still meet the guest of honor who's locked outside the door. Why do you say in Scripture, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. You know who he's talking to? He's talking to the church. He's not talking to lost people when he says that. He's talking to the church. Church of Laodicea. I stand at the door and knock. You've forgotten the reason you're meeting, the reason you're spending this mortgage money on this building, the reason you're putting all the lights and the sound and the stage and the equipment and the songs and the microphones, the reason you're doing all of that is for me and you've left me outside the door. Don't forget why you're doing what you're doing. Oftentimes our religious meetings, our gatherings replace the relationship itself. And we think we're in a love relationship with God when we're really in a love relationship with a song or a sermon or an event. And we need to be honest with each other and say, are we missing the purpose for our meetings? Listen, you can be moral and you can attend church week in and week out, three days a week, four days a week, five days a week. The Pharisees, were in the, they lived in the church. Yet again, the most rebuked group of people by Jesus. Church attendance and morality does not guarantee a love relationship with the Father. What about Bible study? Ooh, now you're talking, Leighton. I'm a theology geek. Love this. Declension of verbs. Get to the Greek. Agape. Eros. Phileo. All the love language, right? We want to get into the Greek. We want to dive deep into that. Well, let's, let's talk Calvinism. Let's talk predestination. Let's talk theology. Now you're talking my language. 
I love getting into those kinds of conversations. Man, that's fun. It's exciting. It's deep. It's rich. I remember God slapping me upside the face and reminding me, Leighton, I'm the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not Father, Son, and Holy Book. Because sometimes we can allow this to become our God. Is this important? Just as important to church attendance? Absolutely. Is studying God's Word good? Absolutely. Of course you should. Is being moral good? Absolutely. But listen, you can know the book and still miss the author. You can. Imagine sitting at a table across from your friend at a restaurant and they hand you the menu and you spend the entire hour that you have for lunch debating over the words of the menu and you never have a meal. You never partake. That's where some of us are in our theology discussions. We like to theologize about the deep things of God without getting to really know God, to know him. And believe me, I'm stepping all over my toes when I say this because I'm an expert in what does not work in loving God. And so I want to learn what it means to really love God. What does work then, Leighton? Are you going to just leave us hanging? <laughs> you told us all things that don't work. Are you going to help us out? I remember this coming full circle for me um, as a young dad. Uh, Esther, our third child, our only girl, was uh, the youngest at the time, probably about three, four-ish. And uh, she had two older brothers, probably six and seven at the time, Colson and Cooper. And we were coming at, out of church on a Sunday morning, and we were going to our minivan, which is what you have to drive when you have three children, by the way. Forget being cool as a dad anymore when you have three kids. It's just one of those things. And so I'm, I'm loading up Esther in the car and buckling her up, and she's, she's laughing, and I'm tickling her and everything else. And I get in the car, and I shut the door, and I start the engine, and Esther just decides to announce at the top of her lungs, I love Daddy the most. I'm smiling. Yeah, she does. And I look over course, at Laura sitting next to me, and she's smiling too because she knows dinner's just around the corner, and she's going to be the favorite real quick, right? And so we're just listening in. I love listening to kids' conversations. Kids teach us so much about God just listening to them. And immediately, uh, Cooper chimes in. He says, Esther, don't say that. You hurt mommy's feelings. And then Colson chimes in, plus Esther. You're not supposed to love daddy the most. You're supposed to love God the most. They've been in study school enough in their life to know the rules. You love God before you love mom and dad. You're supposed to love God the most. Now, Esther has never been one to back down from her big brothers. And she immediately rebuts and says, but God doesn't cuddle with me. You see, Esther and I, I, we had a nightly ritual at that age where she would come and sit on my lazy boy right in the nook of my arm, and I would read her a bedtime story, and she had her little blankie, and I would cuddle with her before bed. She loved that. I did too. I still miss it. She's 18 now. Don't do that so much. But what she was saying was so innocent as a little three-year-old girl, and she's just saying the thing that all of us are really thinking if we're honest, you're telling me, Bubba's, um, you're telling me that I'm supposed to love God who I've never actually seen more than I love my daddy who cuddles with me? How am I supposed to relate to a God who doesn't show up? How am I supposed to relate to a God I don't see tangibly, I can't cuddle with? What is she saying? She's saying the same thing that all of us say at one time in our life. How do I relate to a spiritual being who is not physically present? How do I relate to somebody that way? And how am I supposed to love them more than the people who are right here all around me every day? And Colson replies to her after she says, well... God doesn't cuddle with me. Daddy does. And Colson, our theologian still today, he said this at the age of seven. He said, Esther, who do you think gave you your daddy? This is why you will never see in Scripture anything about loving God that's not connected with love for one another. 
they are always intricately connected. That's why the scripture says, if you say you love God, but you do not love your brother, there's no truth in you. You're mistaken. You're lying to yourself. There is an intimate connection with your relationship with others and a reflection of the love that you have for God. 